Welcome to Country's Family Reunion 2010. Can you believe it's been 13 years since we had the first reunion? Wow, so many great memories. And yet somehow year after year, the reunions just get better and better. With a whole new group of country music legends, plus all the reunion favorites you've come to know and love, this gathering just might be the best yet. So sit back and relax as we share some stories, songs, moments that'll touch your heart. Welcome to Country's Family Reunion 2010. Everybody's invited. Everybody's here. Yeah. I don't know if any of y'all were watching Charlie Pride when Mandy Barnett was singing crazy. Yeah. You, you were grooving on that, weren't you? <laughs> she, she sings good. Were you a big Patsy Cline fan? Oh, yeah. You probably I never, never got I a never chance been, to meet her, though, did you? I didn't get a chance to meet her, though, but uh, yeah. I've learned to sing ever since I've been in the business. Growing up down in Mississippi, who were your idols as singers? Well, we lived about 55 miles below Memphis, and uh, on Saturday nights, we had old Phil Cole Radio, and Daddy, he, he had, all, and nobody touched those knobs but him on that, on that, <laughs> on that, on that, on that, because, you know, get those batteries with the, with the, uh, Tar and everything, and sometimes they put them in the in the in the stove, thinking make them last a little longer. <laughs> but uh, he had his favorite shows, you know, like Mr. District Attorney and uh, uh, Gal Sunday, you know. He's, uh, my mother and father, the, uh, the Another World and Guiding Light and all this, but Portia Faces Life and Gal Sunday. I'm giving my age away, but that's fine. <laughs> but the thing is, is that uh, on Saturday nights that we get the Grand Ole Opry, and that, that my dad's favorite was the Bill Monroe and the Bluegrass Boys. And uh, of course, and we sent off to get, uh, it had those pictures, you know, uh, David Cobb, he had the mustache. I always thought he looked like sort of similar to Clark, Clark Gable and all. They had him in the little circle, you know, and then they had all the Grand Ole Opry members and everything. And I wished I could get him, I, 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 they're, gone, they're gone now. You know, Daddy, he had him in a trunk, he had a trunk, he kept everything there, you know. What but, do you think it was about Bill Monroe and bluegrass music that appealed to your dad? Well, it, 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 the songs, you know, like, uh, Mansions for me and uh, footprints in the snow and all that. I mean, he just he just liked the the, the mandolin and all. He just he just that's what he liked. And uh, I never forget. Uh, I was at uh, down in uh, Printer's Alley and I went up on stage with him and I did uh, footprints in the snow with him. He he look around. And some folks like the summertime, but we can walk. <laughs> sing, sing, sing country music, but you know, but bluegrass, you know, that kind of. He said uh, this. And, and, and I was, <laughs> it's kind of, you know, <laughs> so, you know, everybody, I got to say that everybody has to prove themselves. I, I remember when I, when I, when I first uh, met Tex Ritter, uh, uh, he wasn't too sure, you know, I mean, he, you know, you got to prove yourself. Man. But I came back and he was talking and doing the WSM after, after the Opry was over and everything. So I went up, I said, I said, Mr. Ritter, I said, oh, where's the Charles King? You know, we call him Big Joe. He was the, the villain, you know, the, the black hat and the villain. And, and I, I see, when, when I said Charles King, we see, that's his real name. He said, hey, well, you remember? I said, yeah. And after that, it was just everything. Because you don't pull these things out of the hat, you know. And I want you part of this thing I want to mention, too. You had your show you were doing in, uh, in Charlotte, North Carolina. And I flew there to do it. And, and I wish, I've said this to you a number of times. I wish we could get that clip because I, I just, I, I had to be something like this when you said, Charlie Pride and Snake Scroll. And I, <laughs> I, I had to be because that's just the way I remembered. You know, I did the song, but I was, man, I was so nervous. I, I just, I, but uh, you, you, your, your show was the first syndicated show I ever did. I'd give anything if our television show that you were talking about was still available. But back in those days, they didn't see any reason to save them, and they played them a few times and erased the tapes. I can tell you what I had on. I had on a black uh, vest and a red shirt. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you how scared he was, okay? They had an intercom system at the TV station, and they would, they would page somebody. They would say, uh, Jeannie Seeley, you're wanted in the lobby. And then they'd pause, and then they'd say, Jeannie Seeley. They would do it every time like that. It was just this rhythmic thing. So we convinced Charlie. <laughs> he was scared anyway. We convinced him that people could hear everything we were saying in the dressing room. <laughs> and we, I went down and had him, had him page Charlie. <laughs> Charlie Pride, you're wanted in the lobby. Huh? What? What do they want? Oh. Charlie Pride. 
<laughs> but you were a pro, man, and it, it showed from the very first well, minute. I had, I felt that, I, although I was scared, I said, I gotta get this done. I just can't be a failure. I can't be well, a fa you did, and, and I thank That's you for right. giving me, over the years, I've read a lot of articles where you've credited our show with being the first yeah. television show that you were on, and I first appreciate that. Yeah. Hank Williams was a big influence on you, wasn't he? Yeah, and, but I like to point out that he wasn't all, you know, the, I, I did a, an album called A Little Bit of Hank and Me, which caused a few little different things too. So I was his illegitimate son. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but, oh, yeah. So all these things, you know, some came out like said, no, no, I said, my dad might not like that. But but uh, but it was it was shows like you know coming out of Memphis, uh, WREC, and uh, it, was a, it was a group called a fellow fellow by the name Buck Steffi Turner and his Buckaroos. He'd come on in the morning. And, and we go out and chop that cotton in the morning till 12 o'clock and come back and we listen to the Garrett Snuff variety gang out of Punic. My mother and my dad dip Garrett Snuff, you know. But, <laughs> but I never will forget it. We come in at noon and listen to the Garrett Snuff variety gang and of course Wayne Rainey and Lonnie Glosson. So that's what I had to do. People say, how do you get into country music? Why do you sound like you don't suppose to sound? <laughs> so, so I got all those. <laughs> But I got all those kind of, I said, well, I sound like I'm supposed to sound. I said, I just listened to all of the different singers, like, you know, people like, uh, other than Hank Williams, which was Lonnie Glosson. And so Lonnie Glosson, I would have to say good day and be on my, back to my little country sack, you know, Lonnie Gloss. He said, send get the harmonica. Oh, 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 oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I go back and, 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 and I tell people, I didn't get this on an album or on a, on a, on a, a disc and I, it said, Howdy, all your friends and neighbors. Join us in our Prince Sabbath show. Tune up your five-string band, you hang you up your fiddle, fiddle and, and your bow. bow. Roll, Roll back the rugs on the floor. Light up your old cop pipe. Cause everyone's gonna have some fun at the grand old operator. Yeah, that's what Oswald is here. I used to do can we get a song out of Charlie Pride? Yeah. I think yeah. so. Yeah. 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 Can I get over there and do it over? Give you a Don't, Don't forget yeah. the chord. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to have to unhook here, I think. They wanted me to do the little talk thing with you. There you go. All hooked up here. I'll put this in my pocket. Y'all going to make me go way up there already. Did you say something about Kalaja? Elijah was a wooden Indian standing by the door. He fell in love with an Indian made over the antique store. Elijah, <laughs> just stood there saying he never let it show. Cause he could never answer yes or no, no, no. Poor old Elijah. Feathers and he held a little Tommy Hawk. The maiden wore cup beads and braids and hopes someday he talked. Kalaja, yeah, oh, just stood there saying he never showed her signs because his heart was made of naughty pine, pine. And poor old Kalaja, never got a kiss. Oh, <laughs> no, 
ever had to follow him doing that on no. the opera? Oh, no. It ain't no fun. I'm looking at the lineup. You're next. You thank you. <laughs> uh oh. You know, I was privileged to work the first tour with Charlie Pride down that's right, in that's right. Texas and Willie Nelson a bunch of I didn't want to follow him then and I don't want to do it now. Can we talk about something? <laughs> what, what was it like being on the first tour with him? watching the reaction of the people. It was amazing, just amazing. When he talked about you have to build that rapport with somebody, I mean, he did it this quick. He walked out there, and there'd be a little reaction, you know. Shock. <laughs> <laughs> and all. Shock. Shock. Yeah, but I you mean. You look like us and sound like them. <laughs> <laughs> he come out there, you know, singing, and just by the time the song was finished, he, he had him in the palm of his hand. It didn't matter what he said or did then. Well, yeah. I think it was because, as we all know in this room, he's real. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What you yeah. see is what you get, an honest, talented, mm -hmm. wonderful man. Absolutely. Yeah, but what did he talk about on the bus? <laughs> <laughs> well, what happened on that tour stays on that tour. <laughs> What, what was it? What was it like to kiss Willie Nelson, Charlie? <laughs> Benson said it. What? Uh, Who said what? Ray. Ray. When when at Panther Hall, Willie kissed you. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, no, 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 no. See, that's that's wrong. Well, <laughs> yeah, it is. It wrong. So many ways. No, no, no. It wasn't. It wasn't Panther Hall. It wasn't Panther. It was a. I was just arriving. It's called a roadway in. He was up in the balcony. He's, he's up on the balcony, and, uh, and I was getting out of the car, and he come out. <laughs> Probably right on, yeah, right, right at that roadway end. <laughs> now, and, and it happened, he, I've done it, my, my gospel song, you know, he wrote uh, Family Bible. He came to do Family Bible, and uh, I said, John, get the camera ready, I'm going to get him back. <laughs> so he come off his bus to go and do the song, and I grabbed him and did it. He went like this, and I scared the daylights out of him. It was, I got him back, you know, because I kissed him right on the lips. He, <laughs> he'd, go on, he'd go on people like 60 minutes, and he said, yeah, he said, uh, I did it. I did it. He said, uh, you know, it wasn't too, it wasn't too, uh, he hadn't seen that that much, you know, of coming out there looking like that in country <laughs> music, looking like them. You know. But... The point is, I, I'm getting ready. To, they're getting ready to do a movie on me, hopefully, and I want to, I want to just sit down and tell all. Can I the play you? I You'd hell and how old? You gotta sing that. Now. You gonna sing that tonight? I don't know. I will if you want me to. I want you to. And I, if I don't, if I remember this correctly, now my dad had a band, and I'll never forget this, the, the day that uh, we were standing by a vice at a Texaco station, we, we, he was a mechanic, and he got your, fur, your single or album, but I don't think, it didn't have your picture on it, right? Well, did they no, really? no, no, that's wrong too. That's Is that wrong? wrong? Yeah. yeah. My picture was on the album, but they never said anything when they sent the Snakes Crawling Night out to all of the DJs. They didn't say a word. Right. They, just, they, just, uh, they just sent it out and let, let the, the song and the voice speak for itself. And then DJs would be calling up one of us. Says, you hear that sound? Snake's crawling nice here. Who do you think singing that? Mm -hmm. So what do you mean? Who do you think is? What color do you think he is? He's white. What do you think? He says, no, no, no. I know a white man singing when I hear him. <laughs> 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 so these kind of things, just little by little, each DJ would call. And there were some DJs that didn't didn't play me. I mean, but 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 it it just evaporated just as soon as it. But on that first record, they called you Country Charlie Pride. Yeah, Pratt. well, see, that's another thing. That's yeah. another thing. They said, why'd you take Country Charlie Pride off the, off the record? I said, I didn't put it on. <laughs> I said, and so why did it have to take four people to produce you? See, on the, on the single was uh, Chet Atkin, Bob Ferguson, 
Felton Jarvis and and uh, and uh, Jack, Clint, Jack Lemon, the cowboy. He said, "Why well, take six? I said, "Well, I, Chet told me they didn't want no mistake when they find out what the pigments was <laughs> that it was going to be a mistake." He said, oh, "Those names on there are legitimate." They said, "With Chet Atkins and Jack Clement and Ferguson and Felton Jarvis that produced Elvis." He said, I said hey, this ain't no joke." You see, so right. yeah. that's that's the way that I said. I didn't put it on. and I didn't take it off. So I had to explain that too. So. About the album cover, I was on every album cover. They just didn't say nothing about it when I first went out. Oh, the snake's crawling. <laughs> That's right. Hey, yeah. Cowboy told me, Charlie, that there was a time when you were outselling Elvis Presley by a mile on RCA. Well, I, it, they, they, in the discography that they'd send out, even I said, I'm second only to Elvis that sold the most records on RCA when RCA was RCA. Mm -hmm. right. So I, that, I didn't put it out there, so... Yep. Thank God for Chet Atkins for, you bet. for yeah. taking yeah. a, you know. Well, he took it out to Monterey, California. They all the big wigs was out there, and he, he took a picture with him, and they put it <laughs> on him. He said, oh, the snake's crawling. That's what they say. And then all the people standing around said, what do you think about it? I said, pretty good voice. Is this good voice? I said, what color do you think he is? <laughs> what do you mean, what color do you think? <laughs> so he showed them all a picture. All uh, I, I remember some of them, but Cole, uh, fig, uh Deep, deep, deep Imperio, you remember, mm -hmm. were you on who? No, he was, uh, Jimmy, uh, little Jimmy Brown, was he? <laughs> 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 no, he was on RCA, but 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 uh, when he passed around, he said, well, all of them looked at one another, they said, well, I don't care what color, we're going to put the record out. I ain't going to say nothing about it, and that's the way it's been. And, and the last thing I want to say about this was, Ralph Emery was in Detroit, Now I was living in Montana at that time. And I had driven all the way from Montana, I'd get 200 bucks a drive. I was wanting that 200 too. I mean, I wanted, I wanted, but I wanted to get in front of them people. I had to get in front of them people. So the guy was kind of, you know, they were a little bit, a little bit skeptical. And he said, "Charlie, you're not thin-skinned, are you?" I didn't know what that meant. I mean, thin-skinned. He said, "Well, he goes, you know, you go out on the stage with 400 people, you got 10,000 out there, and, and, and at Olympia Stadium, which now it was called Cobo Hall at that time, I think." Mm -hmm. He said, "Well, you ain't been, you haven't." You haven't rehearsed with the band. You're five minutes off from stage time. I said, no, I haven't rehearsed with the band. I said, but do they play country music? He said, yeah. I said, I'll be ready in two minutes. <laughs> so he hit his finger. So Ralph Emery came up to me. He was emceeing the show. Ralph says, Charlie, how do you want me to bring you on? I said, well, <laughs> this is Charlie Pride, RCA record. Oh, I need to say something, make them kind of loosen them up a little. <laughs> Let them love you or something you know, before you come out there. He said, it's 10,000 out there. And he, I said, just whatever you want to do then. So he went, I said, ladies and gentlemen, young fellow on RCA Records, he's had, he named my three singles I had. Snake Squall at night, before I met you. And he said, got one now called Just Between You and Me going out, kind of going up the chart. It was about, about 300 out of 10,000 applauded. <laughs> but when that Ralph Emery said, ladies and gentlemen, from RCA Records, and now, Charlie Pryde. And I come out of those shadows up in the light. <laughs> <laughs> it's like turning the volume down. You could drop a pen. Wow. And I, and, well, Jack Johnson and I, he's the one and only manager I've had. He said, Charlie, we got to come up with something. So you just can't go in to sing it once you done shocked the hell out of people. Like that. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we got to say something. I said, so here's what we came up with. I said, ladies and gentlemen, it probably wasn't this comfortable saying it. I said, ladies and gentlemen, I realize it's a little unique me coming out here on a country music show wearing this permanent tan. <laughs> <laughs> oh, See, I'm saying what they're thinking. See, I said, but I've had before I met you and just snakes crawling out and just. I said, I'm gonna do my three songs, and if I have time, I'll try to do a Hank Williams or something. I didn't have time to talk about pigmentation. I had to have but ten minutes, <laughs> <laughs> so I hit it, and I and I, I signed autographs from the three o'clock show till the eight o'clock show. It was a three o'clock show, at eight o'clock, and what they were saying, trying to say, well, you don't have to do the three o'clock show, but we'll pay you. I said, but you don't have to do the three o'clock show. You didn't get here in time. That's what the promoter back the stage with I said, well, but man, I did that three songs and come off that stage and I signed autograph from almost from three o'clock to eight o'clock. That's the way it's been for the last 40 years. Mm -hmm. nice. That's it. Oh. Yeah. I don't talk very much either. I'm kind of quiet. <laughs> you started to say something. What did you start to say? Well, <laughs> oh, I, 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 <laughs> I've got to tell this. One more thing on that subject. On that trip. Okay. On that first tour, you okay. know, everybody knew right away you didn't want to follow Charlie Pride. So my ex-husband, Hank Cochran, was on the tour. Yeah. 
So we put Hank there. Because <laughs> half the time Hank didn't know what he was doing anyway, so it didn't <laughs> matter to him. But anyway, Charlie had gone up there and he said, um, you know, I'm from Greenville, Mississippi. Sledge. Sledge, Mississippi. And uh, I don't know how you say I hope you don't mind I'm black, but I'm saying I'm saying country then music. It was, it was or, colored then. Yeah, colored, whatever you said. Anyway, but I sing country music. Well, they just, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. So anyway, poor old Hank, <laughs> they want more Charlie Pride, and Hank's got to go out there. One night he went out and he said, I'm from my soul in Mississippi. <laughs> and he said, I hope you don't mind that I'm white. <laughs> well, you're going to have to follow Charlie Pride whether you want to or not. Oh, well. Hey, well, all you know, she got to do is say, yeah, you ain't going to She's just talking about that to follow me. She's been following me for 40 years. I, I'd rather well, sing than have him tell a story about me, so I'll <laughs> sing. Um, <laughs> well, we were talking earlier uh, when the riders were on and, and Ray Benson talking about the Western swing and the 40 swing. Here again, I'm telling my age, too, but I grew up on the 40s swing sound, you know, and, and back then, like I said, we we might hear um, an hour Saturday morning local radio show, you know, and uh, of country music with the farm report, but other than that, I, I grew up on the 40 songs and the early 50 pop music and all, but my mother used to sing all the time, and she could distract from scolding or anything else by singing. And um, I want to do a song. I, in fact, on uh, the old Nashville Now song, Mother had been ill. And so to, to please her, I pulled this out and rehearsed it with the band. And I got so much mail. And it has not stopped all these years, people saying, I didn't know you did this kind of song. And so uh, it's still one of my most requested songs. And I, I'll stand up and sing, but... As I say on the show, I, it brings back wonderful memories to me, and I hope it will to some of the rest of you in the room tonight. Okay, guys? Yeah. We sing this in the hall. I'm going to take a sentimental journey. I'm going to set my heart at ease. I'm going to take a sentimental journey to renew old memories. I got my bag, I got my reservation. I spent each time I could afford. And like a child in wild anticipation, I long to hear that all aboard. Seven, hey, that's the time. A railroad track that takes me back I never thought my heart could be so yearning But oh, why did I decide to roam? I'm gonna take a sentimental journey Sentimental journey
man deserves a nice hey. hand. Real quick, I'll, uh, I'll tell everybody who the band is. Mike Johnson on the steel guitar, band leader. Been with us on just about all the family reunion shows. David Smith back on the bass. Hank Singer on the fiddle. The dean of the guitar players, the sheriff from the Grand Ole Opry staff band and many other places, the great Jimmy Caps. Back in the cage on the drums, John Gardner. Young man that's been in my band for 28 years, Mr. Les Singer on the oh, acoustic guitar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mr. Dirk Johnson on the uh, piano. Yeah. Great job with that turnaround, Dirk. Yeah. Yeah. Great band, great hey. team. Uh -huh. Hey, Gene. Gene. Can, 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 I share, can I share my little story? With oh, these God, I wish you wouldn't, but go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> This my is brother, back years ago. Yeah, it was a long time ago. My brother-in-law came to town recently and reminded me of this. Years ago, y'all remember when the Friday Night Opry was called the Friday Night Frolic, and it was held downtown in the old WSM, WSM studios. studios. Right across from the studios was a motel that had an all-night coffee shop. And a lot of times we'd go over on Friday nights after the... Friday night frolic, and we'd drink coffee and visit and have a good time. And we're sitting there one night, and my brother-in-law and my sister have come to town from Atlanta. My brother-in-law has never been to the Opry. He had no idea how to dress or what to wear. So he puts on a three-piece suit and a tie, and he looked very distinguished. And he's sitting in the coffee shop, and we're all sitting there talking. The Wilburn brothers were there, several other people. And Gene Shepard comes walking in. Something somewhere along the way that night, I know you'll find this hard to believe, but something had upset Gene Shepard. <laughs> I couldn't hear the drums. <laughs> she, was, she was angry. Okay, so she walks in, and bless her heart, we all love Gene to death, and I'm not meaning this to be ugly in any way, but Gene yes, comes in. Yes, you are. <laughs> Gene comes in, and she is, my book. she is angry, okay? She is blankety-blank this, and blankety-blank that, and blankety-blank the other, and she is going off on it big time, looks over to where I'm sitting next to my brother-in-law in the three-piece suit, and she says, I don't know him. What made me do it, I don't know. I said, oh, this is my brother-in-law from Atlanta. He's the pastor of the First Baptist Church. <laughs> <laughs> you ain't never seen anybody burn rubber like Gene Shepard. Oh, oh, preacher, oh, preacher, I'm so sorry. I, I, I go to church every Sunday. I, I just cut a gospel album. I don't usually talk like this. And then she got all worked up, and finally I, went, I said, Gene, he works for Eastern Airlines. <laughs> <laughs> then she started cussing me. <laughs> he exaggerated. This preacher was in church. He said, <laughs> today is everybody's lucky day. You got some problems, we're going to fix your problems. You need some healing, we're going to heal you. You need to be prayed for, we're going to pray for you. Guy runs up in the back of the church. He said, preacher, pray for me, pray for me. He said, what can I pray for you for? He said, pray for my hearing. Preacher put a hand on his head and a hand on his ear and started shaking. He prayed and he prayed and he prayed and he prayed. Got to do he said, hi He said, how's that? He said, I don't know. The hearing ain't till next Thursday. <laughs> I tell that on stage. <laughs> We've all new material. Oh. <laughs> Haven't seen your show in a while. Sorry. Everybody knows you only tease and kid with the people that you love oh, and the people that you true. like. And I know we, everybody in this room loves Gene Shepard. We love yeah, to hear her sing. Yeah, yeah. We get a song out of it. I got to get unplugged. Watch your cord. <laughs> While she's doing that, you down, um, we know that, speaking of everybody loving Gene Shepard and to hear her sing, uh, one night, and I maybe have told this story before, but I love it so much I'm telling it again. Beside that, I'm getting where I forget. <laughs> but I came into the uh, backstage area of the Opry one night, and I saw Connie Smith sitting in her car, and she was leaning against the, the driver window, you know, and had her eyes closed. And so I went up, and I rapped. I said, Connie, are you okay? Because I thought she wasn't feeling well. And she looked up and she said, yeah, I'm fine, Celie. I just can't turn the radio off when Gene Shepard's singing. Oh. I that was a great, yeah. great compliment. I love you. <laughs> well, you know, the day that 
I heard Connie Smith the first time before she ever came to Nashville. She sang, and I think you know this, she was singing in the talent contest. She was singing, I Thought of You, a Gene yeah. Shepherd song. That's what she sang. Well, I'm old and fat and can't sing no more. Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> I'm old and fat and I don't care. <laughs> That's more like it. Patty Page done this the last reunion thing we did. And I listened to Patty Page in 1951, 52. I thought, oh, God. She's a wonderful, wonderful lady. Pee Wee King and Red Stewart, of course, wrote this. And I just found out they wrote it in about 30 minutes, coming between Bowling Green and Nashville. They wrote wow. the Tennessee Waltz. Y'all ready, guys? <laughs> I was dancing with my darling to the Tennessee walls when an old friend I happened to see. I introduced her to my loved one and while they were dancing my friend stole my sweetheart from me I remember the night and the Tennessee walls now I know just how much I have lost I lost my Stop here just saying, show everybody. We all know because we've all stood behind you uh -huh. on the Grand Ole Library. What you do with your, your other hand while you're I singing. I give y'all some funny signals. <laughs> <laughs> no, you, you do, do what you do. She does. She does it. Yeah. I asked her during the break if you did that when you sang with, uh, with Bob Wills. <laughs> Not really. I don't think I did. You really didn't do that? No, because I only took it up when I went to. Is that a way of trying to keep the band right? Yeah, with most you? of them. You know, they, well, you know, these guys, you don't have to worry too much. <laughs> <laughs> but a lot of times you get a drummer and he'll drag you to death. <laughs> you're good. You're good. But these guys, you don't have to worry about it. So that's part of what you're doing is you're keeping. Or stomping my foot, you know. If I, if I start stomping my foot, somebody better leave the stage. <laughs> <laughs> I think, and I know you'd want me to do this too, we should thank Carol Lee. Nora Lee and Dennis Nora yeah. Lee Sanders. Beautiful yeah. harmony yeah. that time. The Amber National Imbecile of Country Music. Is that what you said? <laughs> that really happened. George Hamilton IV, known as the International Ambassador of Country Music, and somebody got it wrong. I was in Liverpool, England, and uh, the host of the show. Uh, there had never heard of me. He was from BBC Radio Merseyside, and he asked one of the boys in the band. He said, <clears throat> "How do you introduce this guy? I don't know anything about him." And one of the boys said, "Well, you know, he travels all over the place. Some folks call him the 
international ambassador of country music or something. <laughs> and so I'm standing in the wings waiting to go on, and I heard this very nervous <laughs> disc jockey out there trying to introduce me. <laughs> and I actually heard him saying, ladies and gentlemen, without any further ado, a nice Liverpool <laughs> welcome for the Amber National Imbecile of Country Music. <laughs> <laughs> that really happened. <laughs> he was right on, wasn't he? <laughs> He was right on the money. <laughs> You've told me in recent weeks, and, and I find this really interesting. I think everybody in the room will. We know you tour over there a lot. You've come back from Ireland recently, and the family reunion shows are airing on rural TV in the UK, and you say that you've run into a lot of people that are watching them. I was in Ireland for a month leading up to Christmas, and I was singing in churches. We did a little tour called An Irish Country Christmas. And we were all over the Emerald Isle, and every town I went into, people wanted to talk about country's family reunion. And they're all watching it over there. So I don't know where the cameras are around here, but I want to say hello to everybody in Ireland. Yeah. And not only there, but in, uh, in Great Britain, in Scotland, Wales, and England. They're all watching rural Norway. TV and watching this show especially. And people tell me they love it. The thing that has surprised me in the email and all that I've gotten from the viewers over there, number one, you know, their sense of humor is a little different from ours. Yeah. But, but they said they love the humor. And they say so many of them have told me that for the first time they're able to put faces uh, with names and people that they've heard sing because they haven't seen so many of us. On right. You had a television show of your own in Great Britain at one time. Yes, and you were on it. As a matter of fact, uh, we did a... Did several series for BBC uh, uh, in England back in the 70s and 80s. And, uh, but the beautiful thing about it is a lot of television in the British Isles now, kind of like here, it's reality shows and contests. and There's not much music on television. They don't do uh, big musical productions anymore. And people miss the music. And I think... Uh, RFD TV through rural TV there are filling a gap because they're giving people music and uh, most importantly, they're giving them country music. Like you say, folks are getting to see and hear the artists that they've heard on the radio for years but never had the privilege and the pleasure of uh, seeing on television. What's the current status of country music over there? Country music uh, is really popular over there, but they're not so keen on what we call uh, uh, top 40 country or top 30 country or what the radio stations here call country. <laughs> over there, they like the real deal. They love Charlie Pride. He tours over there every year, and, and uh, many of the people in this room have toured there, and I think you can uh, back me up on this. They like it real. They like it down home, and they like something they can understand. And they're not moved by smoke bombs and laser lights and <laughs> all that, you know. They just like good songs, and good people. If they like you, they like you, and they're with you forever. And they like you for a long time. Yeah, cause Hank Lachlan, Slim mm -hmm. Whitman, Jim Reeves. Jim Ed Brown, you have a big following. Absolutely. I do. In fact, Jim, talking about this, RFD, uh, I am getting emails from Russia and they're saying that they're getting it some way through RF, RFD is uh, responsible for it from Russia. I also got one from China, from Norway. Wow. But yes, uh, my emails are they're unreal. But I love to, I just, you know, I, last year I was in Norway and uh, also in Ireland. And uh, the people over there love country music. But they like, as he said, they like the real country music. Yeah. And it's great, you know, that, that country music is once again getting into, and, and I think it's, the country, the family reunion here is responsible for much of that, getting out into Ireland and, and England and all of those places again because the country was down for a while, but it's coming back up, and I think that's great, and I think it's a lot, a lot of it is responsible for, the RFD is responsible for it, and, and you know, and country family reunion. Mm -hmm. A lot of the emails they want to know when we're coming over. Y'all want yes. to go? Sure. Yeah, let's go. Yeah. Oh, let's go. Yeah. Load the bus. I got my passport. Yeah. 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 Hit the, the cowboy way. <laughs> okay. I'll, I'll I have. I think I've told George this before, but it was. It was. I think around 1989, 1990, something like that. And you know, they went through a period which they're probably still doing. But they fired 
the DJs who had been there a long time because they could get new young ones a lot cheaper. And this is obviously what was happening at this radio station. And he had played some, you know, newer country music. And then he said, we've got a record today by a new young fella. We're going to give it a spin. His name's George Hamilton IV. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, I'm, I'm wearing my number today. Oh, no. yeah. And just when I got to thinking everybody knew that stood for the fourth, okay. somebody came up to me the other day somewhere. I had this on, and they said, what does that mean? Is that intravenous? Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Ralph Emery used to call me uh, the number uh, yeah. I, yeah. I, I, I think I he did. did. And uh, Tex Ritter, I think, was the first that said, here he comes again, the number. <laughs> <laughs> well, now, there's a number five, your son Chip. George Hamilton V uh, is a singer-songwriter, and uh, he sings with me often on the Opry. And about nine years ago, he presented us with a brand new grandson. You All guessed right. it, George Hamilton the sixth. Right. <laughs> so um, the, the seventh, that's another problem. We'll leave that to him. <laughs> You're going to have to go digital soon. <laughs> <laughs> you got some new words to an old song of yours. Yeah, um, we recorded a song in 1963 called Abilene. Mm -hmm. And it's been a long time ago, and a lot of folks might not remember it, so I thought maybe we'd do just a little bit of it tonight. Boys, if you want to start me out on Abilene here, maybe you'll remember that. Abilene, Abilene, prettiest town that I've ever seen. Folks out there don't treat you Well, first of all, that's biblical. I don't know if y'all are aware of it or not, but I was in a church a while back, and a preacher asked me to sing it. And I said, well, Pastor, do you think it's appropriate to sing Abilene in church? He said, well, it's biblical. And I said, it is? And he said, yeah. He said, tonight when you're having your late night Bible study, or if you do that in the morning, check out Luke chapter 3, verse 1. It refers to Lysanias, the Tetrarch of Abilene, back in the days when John the Baptist began his ministry. Then he went on to tell me that the capital of Abilene is Abila, and it's about 18 miles northwest of present-day Damascus, Syria. That's probably all the news you needed to know about <laughs> Abilene. <laughs> but anyway, this fellow from South Carolina called me up a couple years ago when something was happening all over the country. And he called me up, this was a couple summers ago, and he said, George, I've got some new words to Abilene. And I said, well, how'd you do that? It's already been writ. And he said, well, you know, something's going on in this country, and you need to hear these new words. And he sent them out to me, and he was right. They were very topical and very contemporary then. And I think it's starting to become topical and contemporary all over again. So here's some new words to an old melody from Scott Bowen of South Carolina. Gasoline, gasoline, highest prices that I've ever seen. What on earth is going on with gasoline, oh gasoline? Fill my tank the other night. Watch that meter just spin out of sight. Don't I wish they would lower the price of gasoline? Oh, gasoline. What do you think about it, boys? There they are. How about a hand for the fiddle man? Any fun? State of North Carolina, Jimmy Gabs. I believe you took it. Oh, 
we talk Texas piano now, especially for Brother Ray Benson over there. <laughs> Nowadays, my old car, she spends a lot of time in my backyard. We can't afford to take her very far on gasoline. Oh, gasoline, help me if you know it now. Gasoline, gasoline, highest prices that I've ever seen. What on earth is going on with gasoline? Oh, gasoline. Aren't we tired of getting reamed by gasoline? It is happening again, you know. Yeah. Have you recorded that? Because I know people that go right wonder where they can buy that. Yeah, I recorded it two years ago, and uh, I went into the studio as soon as I got it, and it was doing real good till about September. Price of gas started dropping in September, and my record just fell right out of the charts. Disappeared. Well, you know what? Lee Greenwood's had number one record how many times? But God bless the USA. Is so that this right? gas thing ought to work for you. <laughs> it's gone back up since we've been in here. My <laughs> well, George, I've I've heard that song done uh, uh, with the uh, in in clubs as Vaseline, oh, Vaseline. Oh, <laughs> you fill in the rest. <laughs> hey, Bill. Okay, I, can I make a political statement? No. Uh, no, no, I, no. Go ahead. Okay. Now. If we see what all's going on, I just want to make this statement. Because I believe the only thing that's going to fix our Congress is if we have term limits. Yes. Of course, yes. the problem is they got to vote for them. <laughs> so that probably ain't ever going to happen. <laughs> but I believe they ought to be allowed to serve two terms. One in office and one in jail. <laughs> I just wanted to say that. Yeah. <laughs> hey, we got a few people here in, in our circle that have never been here before. Yeah. And uh, I, I will, BJ Thomas has totally overdressed for the occasion. <laughs> but you know, like, well, Matt is so good to have you well, here. That's the least I can do is. You got yeah, a whole room full of fans and friends here. Well, I did, you know, I was on the. One of the first ones, maybe just right after you guys were right before you with the uh, Ralph Emery. That's right, you were. Back in 90, 90, 97, 97, I think, is when we did I the was, very first yeah. ones. Well, what took you so long to come back? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I'm not sure you asked me to come back till now. <laughs> you've, I, had I kinda, a, you've had I've an I've incredibly... been there in, over in Ireland trying to do my music, so I, I know they really like traditional country over there. You've had a career that has spanned all I different kinds of music. We won't go there. Let's don't go. Let's start over. Cut that out. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> now, I was going to lead up to something that I was told before Please. the show that, of course, you, you really started out, I guess, as a pop singer. I mean, I know your roots were in country. A lot of them down in Texas. You had a great pop career, million-selling records like Raindrops Keep Falling on My Head and things like that. You had a country career for a time. You spent uh, a lot of your time or most of your time doing gospel yeah, music. Yeah. Yeah. Things in your life changed a lot. Somebody was telling me that you've got a great story about opening a show early in your career for the great R&B singer James Brown. Well, yeah. <laughs> well, when I had my first first hit with the I'm So Lonesome, they booked me out uh, for three days with James Brown. <laughs> and then uh, I worked with James, and he wouldn't speak to me, but I worked with James, and, uh, uh, and then I worked a few days with uh, Jackie Wilson, and uh, then they realized, Charlie, this is for you. They realized I was, a, I wasn't black, mm -hmm. and uh, and so then then they sent me out with Dick Clark, you know. But you know, when I was a kid, even though when Charlie did Jimmy, uh, uh, what was that song he did? Collage. I tell you, it brought tears to my eyes because my dad was such a big uh, Hank fan, and 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 I and I was too. But uh, all my heroes when I started were, were all the black singers who were the uh, you know, the R&B singers who were the greatest singers of their of their time. I'm not sure you can say that anymore. I mean, uh, we still got Charlie, but you know, he's you know he's one of the best singers I've ever heard. But uh, that's how that's how I started, and I loved Hank Williams. But uh, you know, uh, 
uh, my dad really, really, his biggest hero was Ernest Tubb, but uh, I just, I couldn't, uh, I couldn't really do that, that Ernest, Ernest thing real well, and uh, I just loved, uh, I loved what Hank did, and I saw Hank sing when, you know, when I was a, I was a young guy, and, and uh, you know, how he, he threw his guitar down, and they brought a chair out, and he, he sat down in his chair and did his, did his act, and I didn't realize he probably was, wasn't doing very well, but, uh, but it was, I was amazed to, at that, and, and of course, Ernest, Ernest closed the show, and, and uh, so that's, that's always been in my mind. I, I, I feel like I'm uh, as country as, um, oh, I'm probably getting in trouble here, as country as, uh, you know, Jim Reeves and Marty Robbins, people like that, they were always kind of the guys that I, I looked up to uh, along, with, uh, along with Hank, and, and, of course, and of course, Ernest. You, you just couldn't match what Ernest was doing. He was one of a, one of a kind, but I, I have been there on that uh, on that tour in in Europe, um, trying to do my pop stuff, and, uh, and you know they 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 didn't they didn't take to it too well. And I know you've heard of that tour where they, when you get to Switzerland, you know they boot off this line of luminaries, you know. And I joined I joined that list, and it's still it's, it's still a special night for me. I, I'll tell you. And, uh, <laughs> It made me wish I knew some more Hank Williams songs than I, than I did. But There's a guy sitting down here to my left and right across from you that uh, had a no, pretty big exactly hand in, first, your, in your career. Country, country hit. Was, sure uh, did. Larry Butler, yeah, just a, a piano player, arranger, uh, record producer, songwriter. Talk, talk about writing the, the, the big song that you wrote for B.J. Of course, it was... Um, Oh, of course. I, uh, the I'm name of it, of, of course, that. was. Somebody Done Somebody Wrong Song. Yeah. Matter of fact, it's, hey, won't you play another Somebody Done okay. Somebody Wrong Song. <laughs> yeah. I, was, uh, I was leaving my office, and I got a call from my buddy, Chips Moman. Chips said, Where, what are you doing after work? And I said, I'm going home. He said, well, stop by the house. So I stopped by, and we shot some pool. And, and of course, and any time two songwriters get together, it usually winds up in the music room. Here's a song I wrote six months ago. Here's a song I wrote last month. Here's a song I wrote while you were singing that last song. You know, <laughs> but then he, then he told me that he had this idea for a song that he had for two and a half years. He said, for two and a half years, I've been trying to get somebody to help me finish this song. I said, well, let me hear it. And he hit the chord and the guitar. It's lonely out tonight. The feeling just got right. 20 minutes later, the song was finished. Mm. Mm. It came like this. I mean, it was, we couldn't write the words down fast enough because they were coming so fast. Mm. So when we finished writing it, I said, I got a session coming up. I'm going to do this with this new artist. He said, you know, I'm getting ready to produce BJ. He said, I think I'll do it with him. And I said, okay. He didn't say another word. About a month, month and a half later, he called me one day and he said, stop by the studio. I went in and sat down, and he played it for me. I got chill bones. I got uh, the hair on the back of my neck was standing up, and I, I teared up because, Bill, you know how much I love music. Music's my life. I've never heard a song that I was so immediately convinced that that was going to be a huge, huge song. Or the worst one he ever had. <laughs> <laughs> well, he liked it so well, he made me record it. it. That's right. I did it with Gene. Yeah. I, oh, you did? Yeah. Well. <laughs> sure did. You know, it could be a hit again, maybe, you know. But uh, I did it. We recorded over on 17th Street. Right. And, uh, uh, you know, we'd finished the album. And I, th I guess he had just talked to you. Right. Because we'd finished the album, and, uh, you know, we were talking, and he said, you know, B.J., I'm, I'm not sure we, we've got a hit record on, on here. And I said, you know, uh, I don't know if we have either. And uh, Bobby Emmons uh, uh, from the American Studio Group, and it, which is a very unrecognized and unappreciated sure. uh, recording band. You know, they ought to be in the Hall of Fame. But he said, hey, pl play BJ that, uh, that new song you just wrote with uh, Butler. And, you know, his face got red. And I don't know if he just, <laughs> he just didn't remember it or what. But anyway, he played it. And it was an instantaneous thing. Just like he said, it just, uh, you just knew it was going to be yeah. really, really nice. Yeah. I never, I never really thought about it being, uh, being a bomb. I'm oh, I was glad, scared. I'm glad it wasn't. <laughs> and then, you know Chips, of course. Yeah, yeah. It's been out a week, so I called Chips. I said, "How are we doing?" 
on, on the B.J. Thomas thing. He said, we're a little over a quarter of a million. I said, oh, come on, Chips. I said, seriously, how are we doing? He said, a little over a quarter of a million. I said, okay, man, it's good to hear from you. So I called the record company and talked to the promotion guy at the record company. I said, well, look, I just talked to Chips. He said, we're, we're over a quarter of a million. He said, oh, yeah, we are. But he said, well, matter of fact, we're real close to 300,000 in one week. Wow. Yeah, yeah, well. You know what? You know what? We're this looking is the for the first another week opportunity like that. I've had to publicly thank you for singing that song. Oh, man, you don't have to thank me. <laughs> thank, thank you. Thank you, Dave. Thank you. It's lonely out tonight, and the feeling just got right for a brand new love song. Somebody done somebody wrong song. Hey, won't you play another somebody done somebody wrong song and make me feel at home while I miss my baby, while I miss my baby. So play, play to me a sad melody so sad that it makes everybody cry a real hurting song of that love that's gone wrong cause I don't want to cry all alone hey won't you play another somebody done somebody wrong song and make me feel at home while i miss my baby while i miss my baby melody so sad that it makes everybody cry a real hurting song about love that's gone wrong cause I don't want to cry all alone hey won't you play Another somebody done somebody wrong song and make me feel at home while I miss my baby while I miss my baby won't you play won't you play another somebody done somebody wrong song and make me feel while I miss my baby, while I miss my baby, won't you play another somebody done somebody wrong song and make me feel at home while I miss my baby, while I miss my baby. Great How does it make you feel, Butler, after all of these years to, uh, to still hear it like makes that? Feel it makes you feel rich. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know what? It's a, it's a thrill. It really is a thrill. And I've, I've taught to uh, people in music stores, at large music stores, songwriting classes and, and classes about making music, making records or whatever. And I, I told every one of them, I said, you know something? I started doing this about 40 years ago. You know what I do whenever a song of mine comes on the radio? They say, what? I say, turn it up. <laughs> <laughs> it's just as exciting today yeah. as it was 40 years ago. Yeah. You're just a uh, kid. Yeah, oh, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I started when I was five. 
<laughs> I don't know if everybody in the room realizes you produced The Gambler by Kenny Rogers. Yes. Yeah. You yeah. produced uh, not yes. only that song by BJ, but others. You produced several records, hit records on Gene Shepard. While we're making uh, thanks to people. <laughs> don't you tell it. I'm going to tell it. <laughs> My first job as a producer was at Capitol Records. I had played piano, as you know, many, many recordings, five or six years. I walked in a tree one day, and Curly Pubman said, Kelso's looking for a producer. And I ran out the door, ran down the street, ran down 16th, ran up the stairs, and I couldn't talk for about five minutes. I was so completely out of breath. I said, I want the job. I heard you looking. He said, Larry, I've already hired somebody. I said, well, I don't know who you hired, but they, they will not do the job for you that I would have done. Left. 7 o'clock the next morning, my phone rang. It was Kelso. He said, Meet me at the office at 9 o'clock. I couldn't sleep last night. So I made him at 9 o'clock. He gave me the job. He looked down the, the list of artists. He said, you see anybody you want to work with? So I looked down the list, and I saw Gene Shepard. I said, I would love to work that with Gene Shepard. That was your first mistake. No, no, no. <laughs> so the reason I told you this little story, this lady allowed me to take her in the studio. She put her recording career in the hands of someone who had never produced a record in their life. But she gave me that chance. She, however, did say the first time we met, <laughs> well, now I got a damn hippie producing me. <laughs> <laughs> and I got to tell you. If you could have seen him, you'd have wanted to. I had longer hair and I you know. Big old beard, he was just fuzzy all over. Oh, I, I, <laughs> <laughs> and I, and I got to tell one more on her. The first session that the first session I booked on her, she came out of the office. She said, "Who all we got?" I said, "Well, we got so and so on bass and drums." I don't know. Who's on steel? I said, "Pete Drake." And God rest his soul. She said, "Well, he can make that thing talk, but he can't play steel." <laughs> 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 I made yeah, you get Hal Rudd. Did you make me get Hal Rudd? I really did. Well, you cut some great records with her, and uh, personally, I'll thank you for recording a song that a friend of mine wrote called Slipping Away. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, now, let me tell you something about this turkey. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. We, we, we recorded out at House of Cash, I think. Yeah. So we went through, done, come on, phone, and play some of the yeah. craziest song. It was stupid. I know. <laughs> and Benny come in to pick me up, and Benny said, uh, Larry said, won't you listen to a hit song played, Come On Phone? That one, you know. And then they played Slipping Away, and Benny said, that's your hit record right there. Oh, Larry yeah. said, you really think so? Oh, yeah. But it was. Thank you. Absolutely. But we done a whole album of your song. Sure did. I know it, and I thank you for that, too. The best song you ever wrote was Tips of My Fingers. Absolutely. Oh, oh, man. One of my favorites. Yeah. You're very good. Yes, no, let's take a break. Yeah. No,